الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد You know whenever I give a talk in a masjid I always begin with the praise of Allah and I always begin by asking Allah to exalt the mention and grant peace to our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to his family and his companions but I usually begin by reminding you of a hadith and you know why I begin with reminding this hadith not just because this hadith applies to this situation but actually because I personally saw that a lot of us are maybe neglectful when it comes to seeking knowledge in the masjid we, these days, I forget YouTube. YouTube became even outdated. Yani people want 10 second videos to learn knowledge from. They just want, open my phone, 10 seconds, tell me what I need to know, close it down. But there is a hadith that I wanted to encourage you with. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, مَجْتَمَعَ قَوْمٌ فِي بَيْتٍ مِنْ بُيُوتِ اللَّهِ يَتْلُونَ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ وَيَتَدَارَسُونَهُ بَيْنَهُمْ إِلَّا نَزَلَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ السَّكِينَةِ وَغَشِيَتْهُمُ الرَّحْمَةِ وَحَفَّتْهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ وَذَكَرَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي مَنْ عِنْدَ أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم He said no people ever gathered together in a house from the houses of Allah reciting the book of Allah and studying it amongst each other except that Sakina will come down to them. Sakina never came down to a person by watching videos on Instagram. Sakina came when you came to the masjid to learn the Quran and to listen to the ayat and to learn the fiqh of the religion. Allah sent his Sakina down, his peace and tranquility upon you. And mercy encompasses you. The mercy of Allah surrounds you. الْمَلَائِكَةَ And the angels come around them. Can you imagine that? The angels come around the gathering and Allah remembers them in a gathering that is greater than the gathering that they are in. Allah remembers them to Al-Mala'ul A'la, the highest gathering of angels. For Wallah, Ikhwani, you cannot get this from YouTube. You can't get it from just sitting at home with your mobile phone. So give yourself some time to come to the masjid and to recite the book of Allah and to study the book of Allah together. I also want to begin by extending my thanks to the organizers. I want to extend my thanks to the masjid and the masjid administration for allowing us to come and give this talk here this evening. For Wallahi, it is, to be honest, it's an honor to come into the house of the houses of Allah and for us to be able to remember Allah together and for us to listen to some ayat and ahadith. Wallahi, this is a ni'mah from Allah. As Allah Azza wa Jal said, وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ حَبَّبَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْإِيمَانِ وَزَيَّنَهُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ وَكَرَّهَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْكُفْرَ وَالْفُسُوقَ وَالْعِسْيَانِ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الرَّاشِدُونَ فَضْلًا مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَنِعْمَةً وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ حَكِيمٌ it is Allah who made you love Iman. And it is Allah who made Iman beautiful to your heart. And it is Allah who made you hate disbelief and defiance and disobedience. And it is they who are the rightly guided as a grace from Allah and a mercy. And Allah is the one who is all wise and all knowing of who to give that grace and that mercy to. So in this ayah, Allah tells us that your love of Iman and your love of doing good deeds is a favor and a grace from Allah. It's not something you deserve it. It's not something you worked hard for. Allah gave you a grace and a mercy by bringing you to a place of Iman and a place where your Iman will increase inshaAllah ta'ala. So we should see this as an honor and a mercy from Allah who could have given that blessing to many other people. But Allah Azza wa Jal decreed and Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala from his wisdom and from his knowledge he chose you to be among those people to receive that blessing. 
And so we have to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have to ask Allah azza wa jal. أن يعلمنا ما ينفعنا وأن ينفعنا بما علمنا وأن يزيدنا وإياكم علما وأن يوفقنا وإياكم للعمل به We ask Allah to teach us what benefits us and to benefit us with what he teaches us We ask Allah to increase us in knowledge and we ask Allah to give us the ability to act upon it And I want to extend my thanks to all the brothers and sisters who came tonight who gave their time and their effort to be able to come here وجزاكم الله خيرا we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make it of a benefit to everyone. That being said, the topic tonight is a very, very beautiful and it's a topic that is very beloved to the hearts. We're going to be talking about the power of dua. Now I'm going to let you into a, a sort of a secret. I don't think it's really a secret, but ala kulli hal, yani a kind of a secret that when it comes to me preparing lectures and I look at a title, my first thing is that I want a resource, I want a book, or I want a video series from our mashayikh, something that I can take and use it and build this speech around it. Because in reality, from the signs of the hour, is that people will take their knowledge from those who are junior. And this is a sign of the hour, that instead of people taking their knowledge from the mashayikh, they take it from the small students of knowledge. And so, I want to make sure that we don't fall into this here. But the problem is, I'm your small student of knowledge, so what shall I do? And the answer is, we should make sure that our statements tonight and our presentation tonight is taken from the senior scholars and the people of knowledge and it's composed and built around what they said. So I'm always looking whenever I present a lecture, I'm always looking for a resource. And the resource that I chose tonight, wallahi, anytime anybody asks me to speak about dua, there is only one book that I take from the shelf. There is never what's one book, wallahi, this book is, it is enough inshallah ta'ala for you and it contains whatever you need bi-idhnillahi ta'ala when it comes to this topic of dua. And that is the book, Fiqhul Ad'iyati Wal Adhkar. The book which is called The Fiqh of Dua and Dhikr by our Shaykh, Shaykh Abdul Razzaq Al-Badr, Hafizahullah Ta'ala. I personally feel that this book is what I tend to use whenever I speak about Dua or Dhikr. I try to summarize it from this book. And yes, we're going to go into other opinions. We're going to bring in other statements. We're going to bring in some different ayat and ahadith. But generally speaking, I feel that this book contains everything that you need to know on the topic of dua and dhikr. So I say that as a means of encouragement for you, inshallah ta'ala, to learn this book and study it in more detail. What I'm going to do tonight is just to select some quotes, ayat and ahadith mostly, that speak about the power of dua and the virtue of dua. We're not gonna talk as much on the etiquettes of dua, because actually this is in the last two weeks, this is my third lecture on the topic of dua. And I don't like repeating the same thing again and again. I don't generally, I, mean, I, I like to keep it different. So today I'm gonna focus, like the title says, I'm gonna focus on the power of dua and the virtue of dua. And we're gonna start with the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمُ دُعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Surah Ghafir, ayah number 60. And your Lord said, Call upon me and I will answer you. This is enough. If we were just to finish with this ayah on the power of dua, wallahi, inshallah ta'ala, it would be enough. وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ ادْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Your Lord said, make dua to me and I will answer you. This is a promise from Allah. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُخْلِفُ الْمِعَادِ Allah never breaks His promise. Allah Azza wa Jal promised you that if you make dua, you, الْعَبْدُ الْفَقِيرُ The miskeen, poor individual, who has so many sins and so many mistakes that your sins reach the clouds from how many sins you have. And Allah Azza wa Jal promised you individually 
that Allah will answer your dua. And that's why whenever you see somebody who says, my dua will not be answered, understand that this person doesn't know Allah. It's not that your dua is so powerful. It's not that you are so righteous. It's not that Allah has an obligation to answer you. It's that Allah Azza wa Jal is Arhamur Rahimi, the most merciful of those who show mercy. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al Karim Al Akram, the most noble and the most generous. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who answers the dua of the one who calls upon him. In fact, in this ayah, Allah Azza wa Jal says, Inna ladina yastakbiruna an ibadati. Those people who are too proud to worship me. They're too proud to make dua to me. Sayyidukhuluna jahannama dakhirin. Look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the word ibadah and dua together like synonyms. That dua, the essence of ibadah is dua. And that's why we hear that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, dua huwa al-ibadah. Dua is what ibadah is. Like he said, al-hajju arafah, hajj is about arafah. And the whole of hajj comes down to arafah, the whole of ibadah comes down to dua. And Allah Azza wa Jal, He tells us, Udu'u Rabbakum tadarru'an wa khufiyah. Innahu la yuhibbu al-mu'tadeen. Wa la tufsidu fil ardi ba'da islahiha. Wadu'uhu khawfan wa tama'a. Inna rahmata Allahi qareebun min al-muhsineen. Allah said, call upon your Lord. Make dua to your Lord. Tadarru'a. Show your humility, show your desperation, show your need. Show your need of Allah. Like in the hadith of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Alidhu biyad al-jalali wal-ikram, aw kama qal. Plead with Allah by saying, Ya al-jalali wal-ikram. Plead with Allah. Call upon Allah and show your desperation, show your need of Allah. Wa khufya and in private. Indeed, Allah doesn't love those people who transgress and don't corrupt on the earth after it has been made right and call upon Allah in fear and hope. When you make dua to Allah, what do you make dua? What are your emotions when you make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Al-khawf wa raja The fear of Allah and hope in Allah. إِنَّ رَحْمَةَ اللَّهِ قَرِيبٌ مِنَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ The mercy of Allah is near to the people who do good. Look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about the power of dua, that His rahmah is near to the people who make dua for Him. They make dua to Him. When you make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah's rahmah is near to you. Allah's mercy is near to you when you make dua to Him. And making dua to Allah is a part of ihsan. It's a part of the excellence of a person's faith. If you want to be a muhsin, someone who is at a level of excellence in your iman, and striving for a level of excellence and perfection, then you can only achieve this by making dua to Allah. Making dua to Allah khawfan wa tama'a, out of fear. You're scared of Allah's punishment. You're scared of Allah's curse. You're scared of the hellfire. You're scared of Allah's anger. And so you call upon Allah out of a fear of those things. And you have tama' wa raja. You hope and you crave for paradise. You hear the statement of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. إِذَا سَأَلْتُمُ اللَّهُ الْجَنَّةِ فَسَلُوهُ الْفِرْدَوْسِ if you ask Allah for Jannah, ask Him for Al Firdaus. Ask Him for the highest place in paradise. For Al Firdaus, it is A'la Al Jannah, the highest place in Jannah. And it is the best place in Jannah, Awsatul Jannah. And from it come out the rivers, gush forth the rivers from paradise. 
you make dua to Allah with fear and hope, and that action brings the mercy of Allah near to you. And Allah Azza wa Jal said, "Who al Hayyu la ilaha illa Hu, fadu'uhu mukhlisin lahu al-Din." Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin. Allah is al Hay, the ever living, the one who every single attribute of His is an attribute of perfection. And al Hay it gathers together all of the names of Allah that relate to Him in Himself. As for al Qayyum. It gathers all of the names of Allah that relate to what Allah does towards His creation. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has all of the names of perfection. husna biha. So make dua to Allah with them. Allah is Al Hay, the one who has the attributes of perfection. There is no God worthy of worship but Him. So make dua to Him, making the religion sincere for Him alone. All praise is to Allah, Rabbil Alameen. Now I want to take a, a moment here with this. All praise is due to Allah. Why? Because of Allah's names and attributes and actions. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is deserving of every kind of praise. Because no one has his names and no one has his attributes and nobody does what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does. And among what Allah azza wa jal has named himself, and what Allah has taught to us is his name, Ar-Rabb. Have you ever thought why it is that the prophets, alayhimu salatu wasalam, most of their dua, if not almost all of it, contains the word Rabbana, our Lord. So there is no doubt that the reason for this is because of the meaning of the word Ar-Rabb. And that is that Allah Azza wa Jal is your creator. He is the one who controls everything. He is the one that everything good is in his hands, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he is the one who nurtures you. He nurtured you from a child. When you came out of your mother's womb, you didn't know anything. And Allah Azza wa Jal nurtured you and raised you. And Allah nurtured your iman. Allah nurtured your iman. And this is why the prophets, they call upon Allah, Rabbana, because Allah gave them a nurturing, a tarbiyah, that he didn't give to anybody else. Allah gave them the tarbiyah in their iman, and Allah gave them the tarbiyah that was needed to reach the level of prophethood. And so they remember the blessing of Allah upon them, and they call upon Allah, Rabbana, our nurturer, the one who nurtured us and took care of us and the one who caused our iman to grow and the one who guided us towards his pleasure. This is the one that we make dua to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that Allah azza wa jal promises to answer. And the statement of Allah azza wa jal in Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 186. If my servants ask about me, then tell them I'm near. How is it? How is that Allah Azza wa Jal is near when Allah is above his arsh? Seven heavens above the seven heavens. They fear their Lord who is above them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is near. He is near in his hearing, in his sight, in his knowledge, and in his answering of the dua of the person who makes dua to him. He says, I answer the dua of the person who makes dua. He didn't say, I answer the dua of the righteous, I answer the dua of the wali, I answer the dua of the prophet. He said, I answer the dua of anyone who makes dua to me. So let them respond to me and let them believe in me so they might be rightly guided. And Allah Azza wa Jal says, Who is it who answers the one in desperate need when they make dua? And who is it that will remove affliction from you? 
And who is it that will give you authority on the earth? Is there any God that deserves to be worshipped besides Allah? How little is it that you remember? And so now I'm going to tell you what, what we can benefit from all of these ayat. It's a very profound statement the Sheikh he said. He said, for this reason, the more a person venerates knowing Allah, and the stronger a person's connection is to knowing Allah, the more and the greater their dua will be. And the more they will show their need before Allah. And that's why the prophets and the messengers were the greatest of the people in achieving dua. And that is something that they did in every single situation and every single circumstance. And Allah Azza wa Jal praises them for this in the Quran when He says, "Innahum kanu yusari'una fil khayrat wa yad'unana raghaban wa rahaba wa kanu lana khashi'in." They used to rush to do good deeds, and they used to make du'a to us in hope and fear, and they used to submit themselves to us with humility. Allah praised them for this. Because they were the people who knew Allah the best and had the strongest connection with Allah. So the more you know Allah and the more you know Allah's names and His attributes and His actions, the stronger and the more powerful your dua will be. And look at how he describes the prophets. Some people ask, how should I get my dua accepted? Wallahi, I don't know anything better than this. Innahum kanu yusari'una fil khayrat. They used to rush to do good deeds. Rush to do good deeds. If you want your dua to be accepted, rush and race to do good deeds. وَيَدْعُونَنَا رَغَبًا وَرَهَبًا And call upon Allah in fear and hope. Some people, they make a mistake in this. They say we call upon Allah out of nothing but love. There's no doubt that we love Allah more than anything else. And there is no doubt that the love of Allah Azza wa Jal propels us forward on the straight path. But ultimately the prophets called upon Allah in fear and hope and you cannot do better than them. So call upon Allah in fear and hope and submit yourself before Allah with humility. Show your need of Allah. There's a beautiful statement. The scholars, they call it Al-Inkisar. Showing yourself to be broken in front of Allah. Showing yourself to be desperate and needy in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah loves for you to show your need before Him. To show your need of Him. As for in the sunnah, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said in the hadith of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, the best kind of worship you can do is dua. And then he recited, And your Lord said, Make dua to me and I will answer you. Have you ever thought how powerful dua is and how easy it is to make dua? Not just the power of dua, but how easy it is to make dua. How easy it is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have chosen any ibadah to be the best ibadah. It could have been the best ibadah is Qiyamul Layl. But Qiyamul Layl is not easy. The best ibadah could be Al Jihad fi Sabilillah. But Al Jihad fi Sabilillah is not easy. It could have been that the best ibadah was to lock yourself in the masjid and to spend your whole life there, fasting every day and praying every night and not getting married. But what did Allah make the best kind of ibadah? Afdalul ibadah dua Making dua. And you can make dua. Alladheena yadhkuroon Allah qiyaman wa qu'udan wa ala junubihim. You can make dua standing or sitting or lying down. So Allah from the ease that he placed into this religion. Yuridu Allahu bikum al yusr. Allah wants things to be easy for you. He doesn't want them to be difficult for you. From the ease that Allah placed in this religion is that Allah Azza wa Jal made the best act of worship in this religion, dua. 
and at Tirmidhi and others narrated from Abi Hurairah radiallahu an, an in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam annahu qal, laysa shay'un akrama ala Allahi min ad dua There is nothing more noble in the sight of Allah azza wa jal than dua. There is nothing more noble in the sight of Allah than dua. What a profound statement, wallahi, how much we learn from this. There's nothing, nothing you can do that is more beloved to Allah and more noble than making dua. And the interesting thing about this and how powerful it is, is that this dua is for your benefit. And wallahi, this is the meaning of the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal or the name of Allah when Allah said, Huwa al-Ghani. Allah is the one who doesn't need anything. Faya subhanallah. How Allah made the most powerful and the most beloved act of worship to him, showing how much you need Allah and that Allah Azza wa Jal doesn't need anything. And Allah gives you and gives you and gives you and he still loves for you to ask. And this is different from Allah's creation. Because Allah's creation, they don't like to give you in the first place. And if they give you once, they don't want to give you again. Illa man rahim Allah, except the one that Allah has mercy on. But Allah Azza wa Jal loves for you to ask and he keeps on giving you what you want. And even though he's giving you what you want, and even though he's giving you again and again and again, he still loves you to make dua more than anything else. And this is from the power of a dua. A person might ask the question, why is dua so beloved to Allah? And this will help us to, if you like, it will help us to harness the power of dua bi'ithnillahi ta'ala to understand this. The first thing is that dua contains showing your desperation and need. You show how weak you are, you show how needy you are before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you show how much you need Allah. Allahu Samad, Allah is the one who He doesn't need anything from anyone, and every single one from His creation is in desperate need of Him. Allah doesn't need the Hamalat al Arsh. The angels that hold up the arsh, Allah doesn't need them to hold up the arsh, but they need Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need his arsh, he doesn't need the angels, he doesn't need the prophets, he doesn't need the righteous. He doesn't need any single thing from his creation, but everything from his creation needs him. And this is shown in the action of dua, because you are begging Allah, you are pleading with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From this, is that worship is something that requires the heart to be humbled before Allah and it requires the concentration and the mind to focus upon the act of worship. And this is most easily achieved in dua. Because already in dua you are asking something for your own benefit. And so your heart is attentive your mind is concentrating and already you're in a state of humility and need. And from this is that dua requires tawakkul and it requires al-isti'ana billahi ta'ala. It requires tawakkul, it requires reliance upon Allah and it requires seeking help from Allah azza wa jal. And that's what Allah commanded you when he talked about worship. <laughs> you alone we worship and you alone we ask for help. Did you notice how out of all of the acts of worship that Allah Azza wa Jal could have chosen to mention in Surah Al-Fatiha after he said, <laughs> you alone we worship, the one that he chose was, <laughs> and you alone we ask for help. So this really shows your Asking of Allah Azza wa Jal, help and your tawakkul, your trust that you place in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On the reverse side of this, if a person doesn't make dua to Allah, Allah becomes angry with them. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith of Abi Hurairah radiallahu an, man lam yad'u Allah, Man lam yad'u Allah subhanahu ghadiba alayhi. 
Whoever doesn't make dua to Allah, the exalted, Allah becomes angry with them. And we can bring this back to the ayah, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ عَنْ عِبَادَتِي Those people who are too arrogant to make dua to me will enter Jahannam disgraced. And from the virtues of the dua is the statement of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam أَعْجَزُ النَّاسِ مَنْ عَجَزَ عَنِ الدُّعَاءِ The person who is the most incapable is the one who is incapable of making dua. This is a profound statement because there are two things that can really harm a person in their achievements in their life. Anything you want to achieve in this dunya or the akhirah, there are two things that stand in your way. One of them is al-ajz, inability. I want to be whatever in this world. I want to be the richest person in the world. But you're unable, you're ajiz, you don't have the ability to do it. You try your life, you work all day and all night and it doesn't come to you. Ajiz, you're incapable of doing it. And the other one is al-kasal, laziness. The ability is there. You can actually solve the problem. It's in front of you. But you're too lazy to actually do it. And that is why if you look at this dua, which is a profound dua you make to Allah. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal hazan. I seek refuge with you from anxiety and from grief. Wa min al-ajzi wal kasal. And from inability and laziness. ومن البخري والجبن and from stinginess and cowardice ومن ضلع الدين وغلبة الرجال and from being overpowered by debt or overcome by other people this dua contains all the problems that can happen in a person's life the point is the greatest sign of incapability of inability to do something is someone who is unable to make dua because wallahi, even if there is no other door open to you, even if every single opportunity for you is closed, wallahi, the opportunity of dua is not closed. And so the person who is not able to make dua, this person is truly incapable. Ajiz. There's nothing they can do. Because if they can't make dua, what else is there after that? Dua is the easiest thing they can do, even if they can't move their lips. Because of some sickness or illness and the only thing they can do is to make dua with whatever they have, still they can make dua. So in reality, a person who is unable to make dua is a person who has the power to do nothing at all, a complete lack of ability to do anything. Whereas the person who is able to make dua cannot be said to be ajiz that they're incapable. They will always have the power to do something, even if it is only the power to make dua. And a lot of us, sadly, what we do is we take away from the status of dua. So what I see a lot of people doing is that they will try everything that's available to them. They will run from one mountain to the other hill and they will go from one place to another and they will ask every single person they can ask, but at the end, when they have nothing left, they will make dua. And that's the opposite of what a person should do. The very first thing that all of us should do when we're faced with a problem or a need is to make dua. And sometimes, for example, people ask me about ruqya situations and cases. And I say to them, well, you know, they say the person is in intensive care. And you know that we can't go in, we can't read Quran for them. We, they can't even listen to the Quran on their phone. And what shall we do? And I say to them, you still have one of the most powerful tools available to you. You can make dua. They say, you know, you see them like that reaction that it's not enough, but it's just, it's just dua. This is the problem. The mentality is wrong. Dua is the most powerful thing you have. And you should never ever feel like dua is not enough. Rather, dua is the beginning of every single success and everything that you can do. 
Because what do we say? لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. There is no ability to change anything, and there is no power to do it unless Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gives you the ability to do it. And so, du'a is the opening to every change that you need to make. It's the key to every thing that you need to do or every ability that you need to have. The key to it is du'a. To the extent that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in the hadith of Thawban that he said لا يرد القدر إلا الدعاء He said sallallahu alaihi wasallam nothing can turn back qadr except dua. Allahu Akbar. Nothing can turn back qadr except dua. And the meaning of this is, because this is a little difficult to understand, because in reality, Allah's decree, nothing can turn it back, right? But Allah makes dua a reason for the changes that happen in a person's decree. So for example, Allah Azza wa Jal decrees for a person that something bad is going to happen in their life. What is it that makes them receive the mercy from Allah, that Allah changes that decree from something bad to something good? It's the dua that they make. Dua costs you nothing and it brings you everything. So Allah Azza wa Jal decrees your dua just like he decrees everything else. But that decree of dua, it is what changes people's circumstances. It's what takes a person who is wretched and makes them into a person who is eternally happy. And there's nothing more powerful than that, than a person who was eternally wretched and someone who was shaqi, who was wretched, who evil was decreed for them. And then Allah Azza wa Jal from His mercy decreed that they would make dua and that Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala would make the decree of their dua supreme and He would make it overcome what had been decreed for them and that person would become from those who are eternally happy. Nothing repels the decree except dua. And dua is from Allah's decree. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he commented on this, he said, أساس كل خير أن تعلم أن ما شاء الله كان وما لم يشاء لم يكن. He said, the foundation of everything good is for you to know that whatever Allah wills will happen and whatever Allah did not will will not happen. فتيقن حينئذ so the person will become sure at that time that all of the good deeds are part of Allah's blessings and favors. What will the person then do? What will the person then know? The person Then the person will thank Allah for them. And the person will become humble before Allah, begging Allah not to cut off those blessings from them. And the person realizes And that the, the evil deeds is a part of Allah forsaking a person and Allah punishing a person. So the person will beg Allah Azza wa Jal to block between them and between these evil deeds. And the person will beg Allah not to leave them alone to decide whether to do good deeds or whether to, to do bad. This is an amazing statement that he said. If you look at how he linked the dua to this, that when you know that whatever Allah decreed will happen, and whatever Allah has not decreed will not happen, you realize that everything good that you did it came as a blessing from Allah. And every single bad thing, it is a kind of a punishment or, a fas or Allah Azza wa Jal forsaking a person. So what does, it what does it propel a person to do? To make dua, to ask Allah, Allah, don't leave me to myself. Don't leave me to myself from a blink, for the blink of an eye. Because a person who is left 
to themselves for the blink of an eye will not be able to choose the good deeds that will bring them near to Allah, nor will they be able to keep away from the evil deeds that bring about the anger of Allah Azza wa Jal. So the person begs Allah and turns to Allah Azza wa Jal in dua. He said, فَإِذَا كَانَ كُلُّ خَيْرٍ فَأَصْلُهُ التَّوْفِيقُ وَهُوَ بِيَدِ اللَّهِ لَا بِيَدِ الْعَبْدِ فَمِفْتَاحُ الدُّعَاءِ فَمِفْتَاحُهُ الدُّعَاءُ وَالْإِفْتِقَارُ وَالصِّدْقُ اللَّجَأْ وَالرَّغْبَةِ وَالرَّهْبَةِ إِلَيْهِ He said, if a person knows that the source of every good, it comes from Allah's tawfiq, Allah's success, and that success is in the hands of Allah, not in the hands of a person, then the key to every success is dua and showing your need before Allah and truly seeking refuge with Him and having hope in Him and fear in Him. And that's a profound statement. Imam Ahmed narrated in Az-Zuhd from Qatada that he said that Muwarriq rahimahullah ta'ala said مَا وَجَدْتُ لِلْمُؤْمِنِ مَثَلًا I never found a better example for a believer إِلَّا رَجُلًا فِي الْبَحْرِ عَلَى خَشَبًا Except a man floating in the sea clinging on to a piece of wood فَهُوَ يَدْعُوا يَا رَبِّ يَا رَبِّ He calls out my Lord, my Lord لَعَلَّ اللَّهَ أَنْ يُنْجِيَهَ Perhaps Allah Azza wa Jal will save him. Look at the example. If you understand this example carefully, it's very profound. The example of a believer in their life is like the example of a person who is in the sea clinging onto a single piece of wood. And he's crying out in dua, my Lord, my Lord, hoping that Allah will save him. That is you in your life. Now imagine a person in that sea who was not making dua to Allah. And he's in the middle of the ocean and he's clinging onto a piece of wood and he thinks that his own skill is saving him. He thinks that I'm so clever and I'm so, so good that I'm holding onto this piece of wood and I'm going to be saved. It only takes a single wave before this person will drown. And that's the example of a believer in their life. If you don't make dua to Allah and realize your desperate need of him and show that need through dua, then you're even more likely to drown than that person who is hanging on to a plank of wood in the middle of the ocean. From the profound ahadith and perhaps among the greatest of the hadith that speak about the power of dua is the hadith Qudusi in which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam narrates from Allah that Allah Azza wa Jal said, Ya ibadi, kullukum dalun illa man hadaytuh. فَاسْتَهْدُونِ أَهْدِكُمْ O oh my servants, all of you are misguided except the one that I guide. So seek guidance from me. And he make dua to me for guidance and I will guide you. يَا عِبَادِي كُلُّكُمْ جَاعِئٌ إِلَّا مَنْ أَطْعَمْتُهُ فَاسْتَطْعِمُونِ أُطْعِمْكُمْ O oh my servants, all of you are hungry except the one that I feed. So make dua to me for food and I will feed you. Ya ibadi, kullukum aarin illa man kasawtu, fastaksuni aksukum. O my servants, all of you are naked except the one that I clothe. So make dua to me for clothing and I will clothe you. Ya ibadi, innakum tukhti'oona billayli wal nahar, wa ana aghfiru al-dhunuba jami'an, fastaghfiruni aghfir lakum. O my servants, you people commit sins all night and all day. And I forgive all sins. So ask forgiveness from me and I will forgive you. Is that not enough for the power of dua? If you want guidance and you make dua, Allah will give it. If you want food and you make dua, Allah will give it. If you want clothing and you make dua, Allah will give it. If you want forgiveness and you make dua, Allah will give it. And then Allah Azza wa Jal said, Ya ibadi, Law anna awwalakum wa akhirakum wa insakum wa jinnakum qamu ala sa'eedin wahid. O oh my servants, if the first of you and the last of you, and the men of you and the jinn of you, all stood on a single plane, 
فسألوني فأعطيت كل واحد مسألته and they asked me and I gave every single one of them what they asked for now imagine this all of mankind every single person from Adam until the last person on earth and all of the jinn from Iblis until the last of the jinn on this earth all of them stood in one place and in one voice they asked Allah for everything they wanted and Allah gave every single one of them what they asked for مَا نَقَصَ ذَلِكَ مِمَّا عِنْدِي This would not take anything away from what I have. إِلَّا كَمَا يَنْقُصُ الْمِخْيَطُ إِذَا أُدْخِلَ الْبَحَرِ Except like a needle that is dipped into the ocean. Imagine that. If every single human being and every single jinni that has ever lived asked Allah for everything they wanted and Allah gave everything to them, it wouldn't take away from what Allah has except like a needle that is dipped into the ocean. In the hadith in, in uh, Sahih Muslim from the hadith of Abi Dhar uh, radiallahu an. And there's another profound hadith, the hadith of Abi Hurairah radiallahu an. The hadith also narrated in, uh, in Sahih Muslim uh, that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Yadu Allahi mal'a. Allah's hand is full. لا تغيضها نفقه Allah's hand is full and it never decreases from whatever He gives. سحاء الليل والنهار And Allah Azza wa Jal keeps on giving all night and all day. And then He said أرأيتم ما أنفق have you seen what Allah has given out since the day He created the heavens and the earth? It didn't decrease anything from what is in His hand. What Allah Azza wa Jal gave out since the day that He created the heavens and the earth. فَإِنَّهُ لَمْ يَغِضْ مَا فِي يَمِينِ It didn't take away anything from what is in his right hand. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And from the power of dua is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith of Abi Hurairah. إِذَا دَعَى أَحَدُكُمْ فَلَا يَقُلْ أَلَّهُمَّ اغْثِرْ لِي إِنْ شِئْتَهُ If one of you makes dua, don't let him say, Oh Allah, forgive me if you want. A lot of people make this mistake in dua, right? Insha'Allah. So many times I say, May Allah bless you. And the brother says, Insha'Allah. The Prophet said, Don't say this. Don't let anybody say, Allah maghfirli in shi'ta. Insha'Allah, you'll forgive me. Let the person ask with determination and let them make their desire and he let them make it great because there is nothing that com can compete with Allah in greatness when you say inshallah in dua what does it really mean it's like you are uncommitted yani you're not you're not serious about it you're saying oh Allah if you want to give me jannah give me jannah if you want to give me jahannam give me jahannam that's what it means when you say inshallah. When someone makes dua for you and you say inshallah, what you are saying is, oh Allah, if you want to give it to me, give it to me. And if you don't want to give it to me, never mind. That's not the sign of the person who knows who they're making dua to. Rather, a person believes in the power of dua. They say, oh Allah, give it to me. And you can't take you and you cannot force Allah to give you something. But the person asks with determination. Because they know the greatness of Allah and they know the greatness of this act of worship, which is, which is dua. And from the amazing ahadith on the power of dua is a hadith narrated by Abi Dawood and a Tirmidhi from the hadith of Salman al-Farisi radiallahu an that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna Allah hayyun kareem. يَسْتَحِي مِنْ عَبْدِهِ إِذَا رَفَعَ يَدَيْهِ إِلَيْهِ أَنْ يَرُدَّهُمَا صِفْرًا Allah is hayy. Allah is shy. Kareem and generous. 
Allah is shy from his servant. If he raises his hands to him, that Allah returns that servant's hands empty. How amazing is that? Allah is shy that when you raise your hands to him, that he doesn't give you something in your hands. He doesn't return you back with something from your dua. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, يَنزِلُ رَبُّنَا تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَى كُلَّ لَيْلَةِ إِلَى السَّمَاءِ الدُّنْيَا حِينَ يَبْقَى ثُلُثُ اللَّيْلِ الْآخِرِ He said, our Lord descends to the lowest heaven when there remains a third left of the night. And he says, مَنْ يَدْعُونِي فَأَسْتَجِيبَ له. Who is it making dua to me? I will answer him. مَنْ يَسْأَلُونِي فَأُعْطِيَ Who is it who is asking me for something? I will give him. مَنْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونِي فَأَغْفِرَ له. Who is it who is asking my forgiveness so I can forgive them? In the last third of the night. How do you calculate the last third of the night? Take the time between Maghrib and Fajr. Divide it into three. The last third of the night. That a person, if you ask Allah at that time, Allah will give you. You make dua at that time, Allah will answer your dua. You seek forgiveness from Allah Azza wa Jal and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you. This is an amazing time for a person to make dua. And it's not the only time that dua is accepted. Rather, we had on Friday, we had this time on Friday. This time which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he showed how small the time is. That if a person remains standing making dua at this time, Allah Azza wa Jal will answer their dua. And the best is of what is said about this time is that it is between Asr and Maghrib or that it is just before Maghrib. And some of them said that it is in the time of the khutbah in the Salat al Jumu'ah. And from the amazing ahadith about the power of dua, and it's an important etiquette of dua as well. Is the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Which is a hadith Qudusi The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam narrates it from Allah Azza wa Jal That Allah Azza wa Jal said Man aada li waliyan faqad aadhantuhu bilharb Whoever shows enmity to a wali of mine I declare war upon him Wa ma taqarraba ilayya abdi bi shay'in ahabba ilayya min maftaradtuhu alayhi and my servant will not come close to me with anything more beloved than what I made obligatory for him. And my servant will not cease to do good deeds, voluntary deeds, until I love him. Until Allah Azza wa Jal said, وَإِن سَأَلَنِي لَأُعْطِيَنَّهُ وَلَإِن اسْتَعَاذَ بِي لَأُعِيذَنَّهُ if he asks me anything, I will answer his dua. And if he asks refuge from me, I will certainly give him refuge. And the hadith is narrated by Al-Bukhari in his Sahih. What does this tell us? That the way to increase the power of your dua and to get nearer to Allah through dua is to build upon the fara'id with the nawafi. To build upon the obligatory deeds with the optional deeds. To build upon the obligatory deeds with the, with the optional deeds. So that means you start with what is obligatory. And the obligatory is of two types, right? There are things that it's obligatory for you to do. And there are things that it's obligatory for you to leave. And then once you have begun with the obligatory, then you start to add the voluntary deeds, the nawafil, the extra good deeds. Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves a person and when Allah loves you, whatever you ask him, he will give you. And whenever you seek him ref refuge from him, he will give you refuge. A person might say though, this is beyond me. I mean, this hadith is about the awliya of Allah. I'm not a wali of Allah. So how can I expect this kind of answering of my dua? In the hadith of Ubadah ibn Samit radiallahu an, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَا عَلَى الْأَرْضِ مُسْلِمٌ يَدْعُوا بِدَعْوَةٌ إِلَّا آتَاهُ اللَّهُ إِيَّاهَا أَوْ صَرَفَ عَنْهُ مِنَ السُّوءِ مِثْلَهَا 
There is no Muslim on the face of this earth. He didn't say wali. There is no Muslim on the face of this earth who makes dua for something except that Allah will either give it to him or Allah will take away an equivalent amount of evil from him. Either Allah will give it to him or either Allah Azza wa Jal will take away an equivalent amount of evil from him. In the hadith of Abi Sa'id al-Khudri, radiyallahu anna, the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, ma min muslimin yad'u bi da'watin, laysa fiha ithmun wa la qati'atu rahim, illa a'tahu allahu biha ihda thalath. There is no Muslim who makes dua for something that doesn't have a sin, nor does it have cutting off relatives, except that Allah will give one of three things. إما أن يعجل أو أن يعجل له دعوته. The first one, Allah makes his dua come true in this world, in this life. وإما أن يدخرها له في الآخرة. Or Allah saves it for him in the akhirah. What does that mean that Allah saves it for him in the akhirah? It means that Allah Azza wa Jal, when the person was about to be punished by something, or the person's level was not what they hoped for. The dua that they made comes and it takes them out of that punishment and it raises. Imagine that, you might have asked Allah for the dunya. You might have said, Ya Allah, give me. Ya Razzaq, rzuqni malan kathiran unfiquhu fi sabilik. Oh Allah, give me so much money in this dunya. You ask for the dunya. So I can give it in charity or whatever it might be. Then imagine that that dua you made might be the dua that takes you out of Jahannam Yawm Al Qiyamah. SubhanAllah. So either you get it in this world, or either Allah will store it for you in the Akhirah, wa imma an yasrifa anhu min as su'i mithlaha, or Allah will take an equivalent amount of evil away. They said something amazing, the Sahaba. The Sahaba said, Ya Rasul Allah, إِذَا nukthir, O Messenger of Allah, so should we make then lots of dua? Look at how clever they were. They took this, either you're going to get it now, or either you're going to get it in the Akhirah, or either Allah is going to take away some evil that is equivalent to it. They said, إِذَا nukthir, so we should make lots of dua then. He said, Allahu Akbar, whatever you make dua, Allah Azza wa Jal is going to give you more than that. Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala will give you more than that. Whatever you do, however much you make dua, Allah will not tire of giving you. Imagine that every time you make dua, either you get it now, either you get it in the akhirah, or either Allah will remove some evil because of it, and however much you ask, Allah will not tire and will keep on giving you more and more. This is some of the virtues of a dua that we wanted to mention. There are still some more that I wanted to talk about as it relates to the power of dua. I wanted to briefly talk about, I wanted to briefly talk about some of the things that can enhance the acceptance of our dua. In the hadith of Sahih Muslim, the hadith in Sahih Muslim from Abi Hurairah radiallahu an, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna Allah ta'ala tayyibun la yaqbalu illa tayyibah. Wa inna Allah ta'ala amara al-mu'minina bima amara bihi al-mursaleen. Faqala ta'ala, Ya ayyuhal rusul kulu min al-tayyibati wa amalu saliha, inni bima ta'amalun alim. Wa qala ta'ala, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, kulu min tayyibati ma razaqnakum, wa shkuru lillahi in kuntum iyahu ta'abudun. Indeed, Allah is tayyib. Allah is pure and good. And Allah only accepts what is pure and good. He only accepts the dua that is pure and good and the dua from a person that is pure and good. And Allah commanded the believers the same thing that he commanded the messengers. He said, O oh messengers, eat from that which is pure and do righteous deeds. Indeed, I know what it is that you do. And Allah said, O oh, you who believe, eat from that which is pure, which we have provided for you. And give thanks to Allah if it is Him that you worship. 
ثم ذكر الرجل يطيل السفر أشعث أغبر يمد يديه إلى السماء يا رب يا رب Then he mentioned a man who was on a long journey Being on a long journey is a reason for your dua to be accepted Ash'atha aghbar, and that man was covered in dust and disheveled. And that's a reason he's mutar, he's in desperation. That's a reason for your dua to be accepted. Yamuddu yadayhi ila sama, he raised up his hands to the sky. And that's a reason for your dua to be accepted. He called upon Allah with his names, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, my Lord, my Lord. And that's a reason for his dua to be accepted. So what went wrong? His food was haram, his drink was haram, his clothing was haram, he was nourished upon haram. So how will Allah answer him? So we must be very careful that our dua is a pure dua. We don't ask Allah for ithm, for sins. And we must be careful that our sustenance, our rizq is pure. So that our rizq doesn't become the reason that our dua is not accepted and this hadith contains many many etiquettes of dua the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said thalathu da'awat mustajabat la shakka fihinna three types of dua are going to be answered without any doubt da'watul mazlum the dua of the person who is oppressed wa da'watul musafir and the dua of the person who is traveling الوالد and the dua of a parent for their child. So bear in mind here that these dua or these da'awat could be made for or against someone, right? So you're mazloom, you've been oppressed. Now you have a dua that is accepted. Of course you can make it against the person who oppressed you. Allahumma alayka bihi, oh Allah, deal with this individual. You could make that dua. Or you could make a dua for something you want, and this is better. Oh Allah, guide this individual and guide me. Oh Allah Azza wa Jal, give me al firdaus al a'la min al jannah when somebody oppressed you. Likewise, when you make dua for your children, you either make dua for them or against them. But the dua of the parent is accepted for the child. So make sure you think carefully about the dua that you make for your child. Some parents have a bad habit. That when the children do something wrong, they raise their hands and they start, Allahumma alayka bihim. Oh Allah, deal with them. Oh Allah, send upon them punishment. Oh Allah. And this is a bad etiquette because this dua is accepted and it brings problems for the parent and the child. Rather say, Oh Allah, guide them. Oh Allah, correct them. Especially the parent that is mazloom, the parent that is oppressed. And I'll conclude with a hadith. This is the last hadith I'm going to conclude with, inshaAllah ta'ala. Wallah, this hadith is profound to be honest with you. Because again, I just feel like a lot of people, I and mean, when it comes to dua, they think that this doesn't apply to them. They think this only applies to, you know, this is something for the highest people in the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal. And I just conclude with one hadith. The hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Rubba Ash'ata Aghbar, Madfu'un bil abwab. Law aqsama ala Allahi la abarra. Maybe a person, dusty and disheveled, that is getting kicked out from people's doorways. Yani the person comes and the people say, get out. I don't want to see you. If he made dua to Allah for something to happen, Allah would make it happen. Even the person like that. If somebody comes miskeen, the people just push him out from the door. They don't pay attention to him. They don't give him any status. They don't look after him. But if he made dua for Allah to make something happen, Allah would make it happen. So you should never ever feel like your dua will not be accepted. Or you should never feel that you're too lowly or your status is not high enough. Rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is the one with the highest status. Al-Aliyul A'la Al-Muta'al. The most high. The exalted, the highest. And it is because of Allah's greatness that he answers our dua, not because of ours. So a person must fulfill what we've learned today about taking dua as an act of worship, 
about not leaving dua, about the means of dua being accepted, and ultimately about believing in Allah, that Allah will answer your dua no matter how any sinful you might be or no matter how many mistakes you might have made. That is more than enough, inshallah ta'ala, for this uh, reminder. Uh, inshallah ta'ala, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or any we hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he places a benefit in it. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make it a benefit for all of us. We ask Allah to teach us what will benefit us and to benefit us with what he teaches us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those whose dua is accepted. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala al-firdaws al-a'la min al-jannah and whatever brings us near to it from statements and action. Hada wallahu a'lam. Wa salatu wa salam ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.